Hey, Beatty friends, it's Meredith Roddy from Beatalon and Artistic Wire. Welcome to class today. I am so happy to be teaching this class for the Michaels Community Classroom. And I am so glad to have so many people joining me live as well as viewing on the Michaels YouTube channel afterwards. So right off the bat, I wanna show everybody what we're making today. We are making this super fun shaggy bracelet and we are doing it by making our own jump rings. And I am going to be talking about this super cool tool. It's called the Artistic Wire Coiling Gizmo. And not only does this tool make the sizes uh, or the size, I should say, of jump rings that we are going to be using for our class today. There are, let me make sure I get this right, five different sizes of jump rings from large down to teeny, teeny, tiny that you can make with this tool. And not only can you make jump rings, but you can make all kinds of really fun coiled beads and different designs that are for another class for another day. And in fact, you can go back after this class is done on the Michaels Community Classroom YouTube page and watch a class I did way back, gosh, it was probably a, a year ago now, making a really cool coiled spirally bracelet using the same tool, but a totally different technique. And that's one of the things that I love about um, the tools that Beatalon and Artistic Wire have and specifically the ones that we have in Michaels, because if you buy a tool for one specific thing, there are a ton of other designs that you can make with those tools as well. And that's one of the things that I love doing in these classes for the Michaels Community Classroom is showing different ways of using the tools. But this class, or I should say, and this class, not only am I going to show how to make jump rings with the Artistic Wire Coiling Gizmo, but a little added bonus, I have a couple of other tricks up my sleeve, a couple of other ways to show you how to make jump rings as well. So while everybody is bopping on here to class and right before Nate takes the overhead camera, I would love to know um, if this is your first class that you have taken with me, or if you are a seasoned Meredith class taker and you have um, been here for for tons and tons of my classes. I just, I love knowing um, or having the opportunity to welcome new people and then also to say hello to old friends as well. So Nate, I think we're ready to start talking about um, the materials that we need for class today. So let's go ahead and, and start at the very beginning. So first thing we're going to need will be, of course, as I mentioned before, the artistic wire coiling gizmo. And this is what you will see when you go into Michael's to look for this tool. It's usually on the bottom side or maybe it's even on the shelf. But this is what I was talking about before these really kind of cool funky coily beads that you can make. We're not doing that today. We did do that as a class though. Um, and it comes with these different these different sizes of the rods. We're using the largest one today. Um, we are also going to need <clears throat> the nipper tool, some sort of a nipper tool. This is a flush cutter, which means one side cuts straight and one size cuts with a little point on it. And we're going to be talking a lot about that in class today. We will also need two cha or chain nose or bent chain nose or flat nose or any type of pliers that has a flat inside. I like using a chain nose and a bent chain nose to open and close my jump rings. But if you have a flat nose plier, that will work as well. If you have two chain nose pliers, awesome. Two bent, nose chain, two bent chain nose pliers, you see where I'm going with this, right? Okay, you just need two that you can open and close those jump rings with. Let's see, what else are we going to need? Ah, we are going to need some chain, right? I'm using this oval, it's called the Modern Oval Chain. And it's a pretty big chain. Um, those links are pretty large. Doesn't Your chain does not have to be this big. <clears throat> you can use smaller links or you can use bigger links. The fun thing about this class um, that, and this technique that we're learning today is you can modify it a million different ways for materials that you have on hand. 
you will also, of course, how could I teach a Michaels community classroom class without using the Beetle on Findings variety pack? I'm always, always reaching for it. And there are jump rings in here that you could use for this project, but we are making our own jump rings today. Now, why do we wanna make our own jump rings? Well, maybe we wanna make them in a specific color to match our beads or to complement or contrast with our beads. Maybe we don't have the right size jump rings here that we want. Maybe we've run out of jump rings because we use them for all of our projects. Lots of different reasons why you might wanna make your own jump rings. And last but not least, the material that we are going to be using today is the artistic wire, 20 gauge wire. Now you could use, um, you could use German style wire for this. Um, you could also use a different gauge of wire, but 20 gauge wire is kind of my go-to gauge for A, teaching, um, and B, for most everything that I make, uh, I'm going to retract that statement. The 20 gauge is the best gauge for these particular jump rings for this particular class. Um, and just a little, a little, uh, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? A little um, self-promotion, a little beetle on promotion. There are two great classes that we have taught recently going over everything A to Z on wire. So definitely after class today, look for the um, Get Wired class and I'm trying to remember what the name is of the other one. Um, but there's another class also that goes over all of the different gauges of wire and what you would use those wires for. Now, this is what the tool looks like and I'm actually going to take it off of this. And I use this piece of wood, this beautiful piece of wood that my dad prepared for me um, to attach my coiling gizmo to. You can see it comes down here, it lefty loosies, and then righty tighties right back up. So this is the U bracket um, and the tightening device. And I'm just going to go ahead and attach that to my piece of wood. Now you can do this on your desk. You could do this on your workspace, your workshop. Um, but um, I teach with it on a piece of wood like this. Oop, I'm lefty Lucy. Um, because my desk is a little bit too wide and it has a glass top. <laughs> and I certainly don't want to screw this down and tighten it, ooh, tighten it up. There we go, that's better, onto a glass top. So this is portable. It, um, I don't need it to be, um, to be clamped down, but if, if I did, if I felt like I needed that, I could use like a, a, a quick grip clamp or any other kind of clamp or even a binder clip might work if it was one of the really big ones. Um, but that's why I'm kind of demonstrating with this, um, with this setup. Okay, so I'm just going to move back just a little bit so we can hopefully get our best, our best angle. And sometimes the simplest premise is the best one to use, right? So the way that this works, and again, there are bring in, I have four of the five um, different sizes of the mandrels. And you can see down to super, super skinny. This one's great for making little coils. And then up to the biggest one, which is what we are going to be using today. So the way that the tool works, again, sometimes the easiest, um, the easiest ideas are the best ones, right? So you can see this little little top of the handle is, has this really cool bend in it. All I do is I take the end of my, again, 20 gauge artistic wire and I wrap it around once, twice, try not to hit my camera too many times. And then let me center this up right here. It's funny, I'm working at a totally different angle than I'm used to, but I think, I think we're working working pretty well. So I'm holding the spool in my hand and all I'm going to do is just twist this around. And I like how the wire sits against the bracket here and keeps that coil nice and tight against each other. 
Now, when you're making jump rings, it's not crucial that that coil stays right up against the bracket, but it's always nice to have a nice clean coil. So we just wind and wind and wind. And again, there are a bunch of really fun different projects that you can use with this tool. And we have done past classes and we will likely be doing some future classes as well um, with this guy. And like I said, with those five different sizes of mandrels, you can really do some very creative things with the artistic wire coiling gizmo. And this is really it. I'm just gonna keep going a little bit more. I'm cranking with my right hand and I am feeding the wire with my left hand. Now, sometimes when you're doing this, the wire can kind of go um, get a little wonky up on itself. And again, when you're making jump rings, it is not that big of a deal. So I am just going to finish up my wires because I had a little bit left on my spool. I, of course, did not start with a full spool <laughs> of this 20 gauge artistic wire. Um, but you can see I just had a little bit of wire left on the spool and it's made just that, that perfect amount of coils. And I am not, I'm not putting any pressure on this handle here. I'm not really pushing it in. I'm not pulling it out. I'm just letting kind of, I don't know if it's, is it gravity? Is it, it's not gravity. It's not friction. Some sort of physics is at work. Um, but nobody told me science would be involved um, to be able to get this coiled up. It's really a very gentle process. Um, the wire wants to, wants to coil up like this. And I mean, you saw, I'm just really gently winding it around. I'm not going super fast. Um, you could go slower if you wanted to, but that's really all you need to do in order to get that coil to work. Um, and while we're here, let me just show um, a smaller one as well. And I tend to always have a little bit of waste on the um, on the end there from a different project because I want to show with this new um, with this new dispenser pack. <clears throat> when you first open these guys, be careful when you're opening the back and let me show you how to do it. You can either get your nail in there or if you're like me and don't like using your nails for things, you can come in here with your pliers and you just want to gently lift this against the perforations. So I'm not actually destroying the package because the way that this package works is there's a little, little pokey outy part right here. And what I wanna do is I'm actually gonna thread my wire through that pokey outy part. So let me take this out of the package really quickly. And again, I like to use my pliers to take that wire off or out, I should say, of the little hook part right here. And then I'm gonna put it back in because this keeps my wire nice and tidy, right? I'm gonna thread <laughs> that through the little hole. And now I have a great, a great holder for my wire. Now, just a quick tip, you could cut all of this nonsense off um, but what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to trim a little bit of it off and show you. And again, many people already have seen this part, but I'm going to just pull this out um, with my nylon dock pliers and get that nice and straight. So here is one of the, um, the rods that's a little bit thinner. And I'm actually going to put this down into, see how there are several different, let's see if we can get a nice shot of this, a several different holes here. That's gonna correspond, of course, to the size of the crank that you're using. Um, and I'm using, I think that this is the three millimeter rod um, and the rod sizes for the deluxe or for the coiling gizmo, just for you to keep in mind, are um, 4.5 millimeters, four millimeters, three millimeters, 1.5 millimeters and one millimeter. So those sizes correspond 
to the size of the coil and or the size of the rings that you're going to be able to make. So I just wanted to show how a smaller coil can be worked up really, really nicely too, while keeping the um, keeping the wire in the container. Okay, so just a little little extra coil there too. So same same idea, same process with the smaller with the smaller rod. And I think we are actually ready to put this aside and start working with our original coil. So I'm gonna move in my bead tray that has all of my supplies on it. I'm gonna just scooch the camera up overhead so you and I can see a little bit better. The articulating arm camera is just about the best thing that's ever happened to me. Okay, so glasses on for being able to see. And now we have this coil on this rod, right? Well, first we need to get the coil off the rod, right? So to do that, nothing really, nothing fancy. Um, we're just gonna snip here and pull it off, right? Doesn't have to be perfect, doesn't have to be um, anything. And again, you'll, you'll know, that I've been making rings or coils when I have little little wastes of wire on the ends of all of my um, of, of all my rods. And once again, this is where we're going. So in here we have the chain, and attached to the chain, I have all of these rings. So depending on how many rings you have, how many rings you make, and how, how shaggy you want your bracelet to be, you really have a lot of leeway in the design of this, of this um, bracelet. It could also be an anklet. I actually kind of really like this design for an anklet. It could be a necklace, right? We're, we're, we are learning a technique today that is very, very versatile. And you know what I did not mention when I was talking about the, the different um, materials that you need for this class, the most important thing, the beads, right? I neglected to mention the beads. The beads that I am using for the project today are these six millimeter, I'm sorry, size six seed beads from John Bead. And the mix is called agate. Um, I just grabbed it from my size six stash. The beads and the colors spoke to me today. The colors here are the, those same six size, um, size six <laughs> seed beads. Um, and the two specific colors here are turquoise and then the green from the Neptune's dream mix. So um, those, those, uh, SKU numbers are both mentioned in the instructions for the class. And I, you, I always, when I'm doing coils, I work from the spool, right? So you see, I haven't cut anything here. What I would do is I would just make a whole coil because I will eventually either use the coil for a design or I will use as many rings as I need to use for my for my design. I'm not super concerned about, well, I want three inches of, of, um, of coils because I will use more, I will use less, will kind of go as I am going on my design. So here I have my coil and there are two different ways that I like to cut my jump rings, okay? So there's kind of the, I don't know, there's one way and another way. I won't qualify them. So let me show the first way first. So the first way is, and again, this is where we go to either I can see, you can see, or I bump the camera. Um, so I'm gonna see if I can do this so that, that neither or all three of those things are, um, are taken care of. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm working from one end and I'm going to snip the end of that wire. Because remember when I, when I was first introducing the nipper tool, I mentioned that it is a flush cutter. And that means that there is a straight side and then a side that has a little point to it, okay? And when we're making our jump rings, we always want it to be straight to straight, okay? We don't want it to be point to straight or 
straight to the point. <laughs> okay. So what you want to do is I've just cut that flush right there. And now I'm going to flip my tool over. So you can see I was first cutting here and now I'm going to flip my tool over and I'm going to cut here. Okay. And so now what that's going to do is it's going to leave me a flat side on one side and a flat side on the other side. And this is really challenging my camera to be as focused as possible. And hopefully those of you who are watching on a larger screen will really be able to see the difference. So let me cut one, but let's, let's cut a couple. All right, so now my end has that point on it, right? So I'm going to trim that. And I try to minimize the waste of my wire, but as you're getting started with kind of the, um, the rhythm of it all, you might want to use to do a little bit more of a tail. So what you end up doing is just a snip and a turn and a snip. And it kind of gets into the rhythm, right? A snip, a turn and a snip. And you want to try to get those snips, of course, as close as possible to each other. Because if you leave too much room, of course, your, um, the space in your jump ring is going to be too big. Okay, so I've just done, what, maybe three there, good rings. So let's show a different way. <laughs> the other, the next way to do it is by cutting more than one ring at a time. And sometimes this works for me and sometimes it doesn't. So we're gonna see how well it works for me today. So I'm just gonna come in here and snip them down and cut more than one at once. But the problem with this technique is then you have to come back through and snip each one individually to get those, those sides flushed with each other. So it's saving some time in the short run, but you still have to go back and cut to make each of those sides flush. Now, of course, when you are working with, with wire or you're using any tools, you always want to make sure that you are wearing some sort of safety glasses to protect your eyes. Um, especially, this is a really good example. I would not cut this and just let that end fly off. I always hold on to the end of my wire when I am cutting it, right? So it doesn't go flying across the room or or right up at yourself. The challenge though, is when I'm in here and I'm making these little teeny tiny cuts, I can't really hold on to those little tiny ends of the wire. So wearing glasses, wearing safety glasses or protective goggles is always, always, always a good idea. Um, really when you're doing any jewelry or working with any tools. And I, I do, I am um, a little bit, um, at fault for not mentioning that on every class that I teach, um, but it is a very good thing to keep in mind. Okay, so different, different. Uh, before we get to the um, to the putting together of the project, I do want to mention a couple of different tools and a couple of different techniques that you can use to make jump rings. We have this guy also in Michael's. It's actually part of a two pack. This is one of the two pack um, and it's a jump ring mandrel. So it's a, a little more manual of a process than the, um, than the artistic wire coil and gizmo is, but it works on the same idea, right? We're making something round. So maybe we don't need to make a super whole lot of jump rings. Maybe we just need to have one or two for the end of our design. And this is a really good tool to have our jump rings be consistently sized, 
but maybe we don't need quite as many. So this works with your wrist as the, um, the windy mechanism. <laughs> We're just winding around, right? Nothing fancy, nothing mechanical, um, just using what nature gave us to make the jump rings. This guy also is great for making ear wires, for doing all kinds of wire wrapping, but today we are talking about jump rings. So we are making jump rings. And again, you would just cut these guys the exact same way that you cut um, any other jump rings. We're gonna go this way and then this way and then snip and then snip and you get the picture, right? Another way of making jump rings is our good old, old, good old trusty um, round nose pliers, right? And we remember our round nose pliers are different than our chain nose pliers because they have round noses. It's got a nice focus on there. There we go, nice round noses. Maybe I just need to make one jump ring or two jump rings, right? It's not as accurate, of course, because we have a taper here, but from another class that I just taught, you can see I have my um, permanent marker marked right here. And what I can actually do without too much trouble is, oops, sorry, hold the wire against that mark and get generally the same size of jump rings. Sometimes I'm better at this than other times. Sometimes I'm a little more careful than other times, but generally without too much trouble and um, a lot of wrist action back and forth like this, you can get a nice coil, right? That's not so bad. A nice coil that you could turn into jump rings as well. So a lot of this depends on what size jump rings you need, how many jump rings you need, and quite frankly, what tools you have on hand, right? Um, if you had, a, there's a specialty, specialty tool to hold this coil, you could use a saw, right? Just saw right through it, back and forth. Of course, you would need a jeweler saw, and so there, there are, are some... Um, so, excuse me, some additional supplies that you would need. You would need the, um, the lube for the saw blade, all kinds of different things. But there are lots of different, um, lots of different techniques to achieve the same goal. It's kind of the takeaway from this, from this class is lots of different sizes, lots of different tools, depending on what you have on hand or depending on what you, what you want to, what you want to try to work around with. Also, different people like different techniques, right? Something that works best for me might not work best for you. And something that works best for you might not be my, my, my preferred way of doing it. So if you have a tool or if you have a way of doing something that is different and works for you, then that is fantastic. So after we have gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and made sure that our rings are, have flat sides together, not flat and pointy sides together. We are ready to start building our necklace. I'm sorry, building our bracelet. It could be a necklace if you'd like, but today we're making a bracelet. And you can see down here on one end, I already started kind of playing around and putting a couple of, um, of the rings on to my chain. So once again, we are, um, we are going to take those jump rings that we made and we are going to add a bead and then add that onto this chain. Now, could you make chain just with the jump rings? Sure. You could also do something called chain mail with these jump rings, um, but that is not what we are doing today. Today, we are making a shaggy bracelet um, with our jump rings that we have made. So, oh my gosh, so many different different ideas and different, um, different places that we can go with this one technique. So I have my measuring device out here and I, for me, I am going to cut seven inches. If you have a larger wrist, you probably will need to cut more. If you have a smaller wrist, you will need to cut less. Easy enough, right? Another way that I really like to do it is just kind of go like this and be like, okay, that fits around my wrist and I probably can take two off for my clasp and it's actually going to be more like six and a half inches, 
Okay. So a couple of different ways to size your bracelet. Another one before I move on is to take a, um, a tape, tape measure, tape measure. Yeah. A tape measure and bring it around like this. So six inches and probably add about a half an inch, three quarters of an inch for your clasp. Okay. So just a couple of different ideas for how to measure. Also, you have um, different people like their bracelets to, to, um, to fit them differently. So I like my bracelets to be a little, a little tighter on my wrist. Um, and then some people like them to be really loose. So when we're talking about bracelets and sizing bracelets, it does get a little bit complicated um, because there are so many different variables, which is why just between you and me, I really like using, um, uh, making adjustable bracelets for, um, for when I do my bracelet design. Now I'm, I'm holding this chain here with my pliers, but I actually, I'm sorry, with my cutters, but I actually don't need to cut this chain. What I'm, what I can do because this chain is not soldered and that means that it's not, it's not connected in a seamless way. There is a seam in here. Can you, can everybody see that? I'm going to open this jump ring. I'm sorry, I open this link of chain and pull out the chain. And I can actually go ahead and close that as well. Now that's the first, the first um, demonstration of many that I'm going to show with how to open and close those jump rings. And you do the same thing with links of chain. You do the same thing with an eye pin. You do the same thing with anything that's around. You don't open it like this. You open it like this. Okay. So you don't ever want to pull it out of plane. You just want to twist one plier towards you and one plier away from you to open that jump ring. So Let's, let's put that into practice. So I have a little jump ring. And when I was practicing this earlier, I must have dropped half of the jump rings on the floor when I was doing this. So either my, um, my, my hands are very, very slippery and very fiddly today. So we can all do an over under together to see how many of these guys I drop, but I'm, I'm trying to work like way over my workspace. Um, because I've, I've been dropping things all day. So that's a good takeaway message too, that um, when you are working and feeling a little perhaps fiddly, working way over <laughs> your workspace is a great idea because then if it drops, it just drops onto your bead mat instead of on the floor, which is where the majority of my rings reside currently. Okay, so let's talk about that, that opening and closing one more time. And again, many of you, I'm sure know this already, but it's never a bad idea to have a refresher. So I am bending these rings back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And as I'm doing that, notice how the, the separate parts of the jump ring come together. So I'm just offering the smallest bit of, of pressure on either side to join those jump rings. So now I have a really nice flush closure on my jump ring. So I'm going to open that back up. I'm going to add a size six speed bead. And sometimes I will come down here and pick that seed bead up just like if I was doing it with a needle. And sometimes I come in here and I scoop it up in my fingers. Whatever works best for you is what I would recommend. Um, it just, it seems to be a, a, sometimes I do it one way and sometimes I do it another way. Now, all I need to do here is come in, pick up one of those links, gently drop the chain to the side. And you can see why using the flat, two flat nose pliers is so helpful. And see how I'm doing a wiggle wiggle back and forth? That helps bring those two sides nice and flush together. And that is really it. We're going to do that several different times. <laughs> and then we are going to add our chain, I'm sorry, add our clasp at the very end with 
some more jump rings. So here we go. I'm going to, you can see that space there. Once again, I'm going to grab and just twist back and forth until those two sides come together. And there we go, two sides come together. And then I'm gonna open it all the way, or not all the way, open it enough that I can scoop up a bead. Let's see if I can do the scoop method, just like that. I'm gonna do that a little bit more center of camera. Scoop up my bead. And once you get the hang of it, it becomes very easy to keep things in one hand and then do the second part in the second hand. Just gonna give that a little wiggle, wiggle back and forth and attach that to the chain. So let's do that just a couple more times to really drive home the, the point of closing up the gap in that jump ring. And then opening it up, adding a bead. The beads are a little far off the camera, huh? And see how I, I'm keeping my, my tools in my hand the whole time? That is what you wanna to work toward. And it's a really good habit to get in, especially if you wanna take this to the next level and start doing some, um, some chain mail. Because when you do chain mail, you'll want to keep your two pliers in your hands the whole time. I feel like this is a really good first step to doing a lot of linking together. Um, this is also a great way to do what I have heard called, referred to as a cha-cha bracelet. Um, basically, a, an, and, and this, is, this is much like that, um, but it just uses slightly smaller beads um, and you're attaching the beads onto the jump rings directly rather than attaching um, wrapped loops. So we're just going to keep on keeping on, right? So I have my jump ring. I'm going to go back and forth and back and forth, open it up and add a bead. Now, the first time I made this bracelet, what I actually did is I I attached one bead per link and then I got to the end and I realized that one bead per link isn't enough. So I ended up adding, I think at least two and sometimes three beads per link. I could have done more, right? I could have done four, I could have done five, I could have done six. It all is gonna depend on how thick and how, um, how shaggy you want your bracelet to be. That's going to determine how many links, or I'm sorry, how many rings you add on each link. So I'm not doing it quite as carefully as perhaps I could be paying attention. So I have a couple with two, I have a couple with one, but I will go back and make sure that I have at least three, if not four, on each of these rings. Now, one of the things that is happening when we are doing that back and forth motion, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and then opening it up, what that's doing is something called work hardening. And what work hardening is, if you did not watch my, um, my video on all things wire, is making those molecules that are in that dead soft artistic wire, they're dancing around, dancing around, dancing around. By the more you move that wire, the slower those molecules are dancing. So then they start slow dancing. <laughs> so the more we have worked with this wire, the harder it is getting. So for example, the first thing we did that's work hardening that wire is twisting it, is, I'm sorry, coiling it around the coiling gizmo. So that's step one of hardening that dead soft artistic wire. The second step that we're doing to work harden that wire is bending it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to bring those ends together. So I feel confident that since I'm using 20 gauge wire 
and it has kind of, not kind of, it has been work hardened twice. I feel good about that. If I wanted to, to work harden it a third time, sure, I could take a bench block and a hammer and, and tap it out a little bit more. That would slow those dancing molecules down even more. But I feel good that those two things that I have done um, really have, are, are enough for my project. So now all that's left, we're going to pretend we've gone shoop all the way down and we have, have dangles the entire way, the entire length of our, of our bracelet. And the great thing about this chain is if you've made your bracelet too short, you can go ahead and add some links back to it. If you're like, you get to the end and you're like, oh, you know what? I think I actually want to make that into a, an anklet. So all you need to do is come down here. And since we've been opening and closing jump rings, we are old hat by now. Just open up the end of one of the links of chain and slide the other link into it. And it's as if the chain had never been apart from each other. So now you just wanna add maybe two or three links. Awesome. Same thing in reverse hold on to one of the sides of the links and open up that link, take the rest of the chain off and close back up again. Easy enough, right? And of course, likewise, if you've made it too long and you want to, um, you want to shorten it up, you would just take links out instead of adding the links. So <clears throat> easy enough when you are here at the end, we can go ahead and add a clasp. And I think all of my lobster claw clasps have been used for other projects. Oh, there's one, but I've decided I wanna use a spring ring. Anyway, we've got our spring ring there. And um, now what I wanna do is I actually want to attach the spring ring with one of the rings that I've made, right? And the fun thing is I don't need to do any attaching of rings on this other end because, and fingers crossed, I think, oh, yep, okay. I was gonna say, I think that this fits through. So it's a little, it's a little big, it, it did work, but I think that I'm going to add a, um, oops, I'm gonna add a ring here anyway. Sometimes when chain is thin enough, that you actually don't need to add another ring here. But you can see I tried it right before class or not before class, during class. And it works, but I think it's going to be easier to put on and off if I actually have a thinner ring here. You can see this is kind of a thick piece of metal. So that is a, a design, a design uh, decision to make. All right, so I have another ring that I have made all by myself. And the same way that I attached everything else, I'm just gonna wiggle that back and forth, open it up, attach my clasp, and attach the chain, and close that back up again. Now I could, but I don't want to. I was gonna say I could use the um, one of the rings that has a bead in it, but I don't think that that's gonna give me quite as much uh, purchase or quite as much room to put my clasp in, much like I was having that struggle here, getting that um, spring ring clasp over that thick part of the chain. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I left this one chain naked, naked, ah, <laughs> here at the end. I did not start my, um, my loops on that very first first part, uh, first link of the chain. And once again, I'm gonna take one of these jump rings that I made. And I love making a lot of them at once because then I just have a pile that I can grab from as I need. And what I can also do with this chain, or I'm sorry, this ring is add a tag. Now you might be a tag user, you might not be a tag user. Sometimes it's a little bit of just an, an extra component to be on there. I think that they look really nice. Here, let me bring this up so you can see what I'm talking about. These are the tags that come in the 
findings variety pack. It just adds a little extra something to make that class a little more professional looking and a little cleaner. So you could skip that step and just use the ring to, um, to attach that jump ring, or I'm sorry, to attach that clasp to, but I like to use a tag. I think it just looks nice so that you have kind of all of the pieces and parts there on the end of your piece of jewelry. So once again, if you had taken the time to go through and through and through and through and through and do all of those shaggy loops after you made all of those jump rings. And then on this one, you can see I used a lobster claw clasp and I did attach that lobster claw right to the chain. So two different finishing techniques, right? Here I used a spring ring and I used a tag. And on my original, I used the lobster claw and I attached it right to the chain. So a couple of different options for how you want your designs to be. Um, okay, so I think that we have covered everything that I wanted to cover in class today. Didn't think that you needed to, to watch me do a hundred different <laughs> opening and closing of the jump rings, but I think that we definitely got the um, got the general idea of how we take a jump ring, we add a bead to it, we put it through a, to the chain, and then we just keep on building on that three or four, or hey, go big or go home. If you want to do five, awesome. And then we go through and we um, can either attach a clasp right to the last link of chain or get a little fancier and use a lock, a um, spring ring and a tag. So Nate, I think we're ready to come on up and take the forward facing camera. If you are catching me on the live class, thank you so very much for joining me today. This was really fun. It's a little different. Um, and you can always, of course, go back within 24 to 48 hours and watch the replay of this class on the Michaels YouTube channel. Um, and please, if you have made this project, go ahead and post it on your socials and do a hashtag of make it with Michaels and hashtag beetle on because I love seeing what you have made as well. If you're interested in hanging out with me some more, you can always find me over on Instagram at Meredith Joy Designs. Um, and of course, follow Michaels, follow beetle on, do all of the following. And I love seeing, um, following back and seeing what all of the makers have made as well. Be sure to stay on the Michaels Community Classroom website because you'll see on Tuesday, I'm sorry, on Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, and sometimes on Saturdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, Beatalon runs many, many classes with me as the instructor and also with Sarah Lovecraft as an instructor as well. So thank you so, so very much again for joining me. Thank you to Yvette for staying up with all of those crazy comments and Nate for doing a great job moderating. And until next time, happy beating. <laughs>